yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about how to lead change gracefully. So this is what I want for you. I want you to be successful designers who can really bring the power of your skills to the organization. I want you to be able to deliver fantastic products that solve real problems. And I want you to enjoy your work that should be fun, right? And find actual meaning in it. I also don't want you to be demoralized by painful office politics. I, want, I also really, really don't want you to think or act like victims. Um, I want you to deliver the best work that you're capable of doing. And I don't just want this for you, I want this for all of your coworkers too. I think a lot of work is kind of broken these days. And I, I see in my work a lot of people who are stressed out, frustrated, and kind of wonder whether or not it's all worth it. And I'm, I know it's worth it. So many of us struggle with influence. And by us I, in the UX world, we struggle with influence and we struggle with persuasion. And really, we struggle with leadership. We're thoughtful and perceptive, and we're creative. But no one in our company seems to get it, right? There's, I always hear that, like, no, we're not being heard. This, they don't get it, or we need to sit at the table. Um, I, I get really concerned when I hear that kind of stuff, because I think it's really important that we learn how to like, really prove the value of what we do and show up in a way that has a real impact on the organizations. So in all the work that I've done as a strategist and as a UX designer, I really believe the solution for a lot of our organizational woes lies in social, emotional, and relationship systems intelligence. So these are what we call the soft skills. Um, and so we often talk, you hear this sometimes, like it's 50% of our job. And this is kind of a frothy statement. It's 50% of our job, yeah, 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 soft skills are 50% of our job. Um, but let's actually take a look at Daniel Goleman's, the results. So Daniel Goleman is the kind of the, the man behind the, the practice and the theory around emotional intelligence. And he did a study where he quantified cognitive slash technical skills versus emotional slash soft skills. Um, competencies in 181 jobs across 121 companies. And this is what he found. It's actually not 50-50. It's more like 33% of your job is around cognitive competencies or technical skills. 67% of your job is around emotional, cap uh, emotional competencies. The way he got to this was he looked at job descriptions and he basically sorted what people are being asked to do, cognitive to emotional capabilities. So this is really interesting because on top of this, your ability and your emotional competencies directly predict your career success. Without emotional competency, you're guaranteed to not be particularly successful in your career. Why? Because if you want to succeed, you have to, especially in a, in a medium like this, which is highly collaborative, you cannot succeed without getting others to help you, right? Nothing gets done in a vacuum you have to actually be able to work with other people. Um, so this is where, well, actually, I, I want to actually say one thing because I think this is important. I, don't, I hope that you don't think that I'm patronizing you because I know that everyone in this audience are really, really, really smart, really creative, and resourceful. I got to this conclusion myself through a lot of pain in UX, um, where I tried to process and method my way to shipping products, right? But it didn't, the, the no amount of PowerPoint presentation or spreadsheets, beautiful spreadsheets, cohesive arguments, that didn't necessarily mean that something was brought to market, right? Or that something ever saw the light of day. It really came down to relationships. And that's what I've, that's, that's my conclusion and that's where I'm focusing really a lot of my work. So we're gonna talk about change management, what MBA is called change management. Um, but I, I really hate jargon. I'm gonna really try not to include a lot of it. But basically what we're gonna talk about is if you have an idea that you wanna support, that it's not enough to be able to give a very beautiful, well thought through presentation, but that you have to actually work with the emotional mechanics of transition and change. So the first part to think about is that we, we tend to, and by we I mean we as a, as a group, but we as a culture, we human beings, we tend to underestimate the power of deep human needs and um, our kind of animal, animal needs on our daily behavior. Children of the Enlightenment, we like to think that we can override, that you know, we're, we're, our brains are separate from our heart and our body, right? 
And we've done amazing things with our brains. I love, I, I, one of my many historical boyfriends would totally be Wilbur Wright. Um, <laughs> for a variety of reasons, because he's one of us. Um, but people have done amazing things. So I'm not any intellectual, but I'm, I'm really pro multiple intelligences and bringing those into play. Thinking with your brain, feeling with your heart, sensing with your body. So let's talk about, so uh, you, you almost can't go to a UX conference and not talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I actually don't believe it's a hierarchy. Um, I think the age of hierarchy is kind of over. Um, I think it's much more of a network, it's an emergent system but that these needs are real, that you know, we, we need to take care of our bodies. We need to eat, we need to sleep, we need sex, we need all of like things our body needs, right? These are primal survival kinds of things. We also need safety and security. We need love and connection. We need esteem for ourselves and for others, and we need meaning. These are, these are really core human needs. So when you're proposing a new way of doing things, you're often, well, not often, you're tapping into some primal instincts. So how many of you have been through a change to an agile or a lean process? <laughs> and those of you who haven't probably will at some point. So I want you to be 100% honest with the next question. How many of you experienced zero resistance within yourself to that change? Okay, I was like, so some people, I was like, I don't believe you. Okay, and not to, sorry, there's only one person, and this is interesting because I actually expected more. Um, because resistances are actually very, they can be very small. So I'm not talking about big resistance, like no way am I gonna do this. That sometimes you can see the benefit and the value of doing something and you can still resist it, right? Even just a little bit. Because sometimes there's like a little bit of the unknown and what's right here, even if it's uncomfortable, it's what I know, right? It's a known. So there's sometimes there's this tension, and what you're running into is the tension between change and safety. We, we can hold both of those in ourselves at the same time. Um, so the need for safety pushes up against the need for change. So think about it, like businesses, we, we, we kind of operate in this all the time. Businesses want predictability, but they also want to be competitive and innovative. Users want stability or they want, they want something to be. They, they want to know where everything, all the buttons are, right? But they also want novelty. So you've got, I mean, now I think it depends on the context, but obvious, like, there's, there are these tensions at work. So the thing about change is that change is just destabilizing. I mean, that seems like a really obvious, an obvious statement, but change is destabilizing. Resistance prevents change and it preserves stability. So if stability is one of your core, is a core need, and safety is a core need, resistance is a protective, is a protective thing, right? So it has a really good, um, a really good value to it. So can I get the house lights for a second, if that's possible? I know, surprise! I forgot this part too. Well, you know what, don't even worry about it. What I want you to do, I'm gonna ask you to stand up, I want you to find a total stranger, and I want you to divulge your deepest, darkest secret to them. Go. <laughs> No? Okay. <laughs> so, notice what's happening in the room. Nothing happened. Well, actually, not nothing. What happened in the room? Laughter. Tons of laughter. Discomfort. Who had to go to the bathroom all of a sudden? <laughs> or was like, oh, geez, I should really check my email. Or, God, I, what's happening on Twitter right now? Right? These, are like, these are not big resistances, they're small resistances. I asked you to do something ridiculous that is incredibly vulnerable. Right? And you react by, well, nobody moved. Right? But I, because I wanted to demonstrate what happens. That's an edge behavior. We're going to talk a little bit more about edge behaviors in a second. But here's the thing, is that change is edgy. And by edgy, you know, edgy is like, it's emotionally, it's hot. It can't, this is where big emotions show up. Right? Because you're asking someone to do something that is you know, working against their sense of stability, even if they want to do the change, even if they can intellectually see the benefits of the change. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this theory, um, because who are we if we don't have frameworks to organize chaos for ourselves? Or at least me, I'll speak for myself. So there are patterns in change. Um, this is kind of an adaptation of a theory, a change theory that um, comes out of the organizational relationship systems coaching, and I've kind of tried to make it a little simpler. But 
So essentially, there's, there are two states. There's the current state, and there's the future state. And then there's the transition between the two, right? So, so imagine the current state is what's here now, and the future state is where you might go next. So think of this, um, sometimes when I've, I've given a talk before lunch, a really good example is, the current state is you're sitting listening to me. Actually, here's a better example. The current state is you're listening to me. A potential future is you're going to listen to Bill McIntyre, who's next. Right? That's hanging out there someplace. That's a, that'll be your next state. And there's going to be some kind of a transition. That's a very not terribly edgy um, example, hopefully. Um, so there's, that's, that's essentially the structure. So let's actually look at this even a little bit with a little more, more concreteness. How many people have had to change seats reorganize the physical layout of your office. Yeah. Which is like one of the most emotionally fraught changes there is in an organization. With, from all, because it's like, it's a, like identity. Who am I? Who will I be? I'm, I sit with my department right now and I'm a UXer, but then I got to sit with my product team. And then what happens? Like, am I a UXer anymore? I'm a member of this product team. And what I really like is walking in the morning and getting my coffee and I only have to walk 10 feet to the bathroom. And, you know, there's like all of this stuff that happens. And right, what, what actually happens when you move and now you sit with your product team, you get used to it's a new habit. You get used to it. You form some new neural pathways. Now you really like sitting next to Joe and saying hello to blah, blah, blah in the morning. And you like your new identity as part of a product team, maybe. Or maybe not. Maybe then the company does something like, is like, we're getting rid of the office completely. We're all going to virtual and you're going to go work at home. So that's a pretty huge edge, right? And a lot of companies don't manage that edge gracefully, right? Because there's going to be a big reaction here. And then we're going to talk how to actually navigate that with some grace. So change just strings together. Change is, it's, it's going to happen. It's always going to happen. Wherever you're sitting now is not where you're going to be sitting two years from now. That's just the way it is. And it's always been that way. It's not a feature of our culture. It's not a feature of technology now. There's um, that change, everything, everything changes is, is actually attributed back to a Greek philosopher. It's not, it's nothing, nothing new, right? So change is edgy. So we talked about edge behaviors. Edge behaviors that show up at an edge. So posture changes. And these are, these are again, these are little things. This is, these are things for you to notice that an edge is present, right? We don't know what any of them mean. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really clear. We don't know what a posture shift means. We, we, we cannot read people's minds. All we can do is observe their behavior, right? So posture shifts. Um, giggling. I love That's my favorite. Some kind of a change in tone. Maybe they'll speak higher or lower. They may break eye contact. There's some kind of a content shift. Actually, let's not talk about, it's not about the shifting of the chairs where we're sitting. It's really about the toilet paper in the bathroom, right? So somebody, they change the subject. You don't have to talk about this because we're going to talk about this other rat's nest that's going to keep us from doing this change. Fidgeting, unfinished sentences, loss of energy. Ugh, the room goes, ugh. Another really good clear is if you suddenly feel confused, like you have no thoughts, right? It's like, or the people around you seem that way too. So these are all just signs that an edge is present. And it's really just, it's important for you to notice because crossing an edge is, a, is, is an art. And we're going to talk about that in a second. If you jam someone over the edge too fast um, and you don't allow them time to actually process and work through their resistance, you enter a state that's called realm. <laughs> Can you imagine what a realm feels like? <laughs> Edward Monk. Um, he, he's a poor guy. He has no idea. Um, but realm is that state where everything is crap. Everything has always been crap. Everything will always be crap. Right? It's like, no, this organization can't possibly change. Nothing is going to change. We're always going to be like this. It's a shut down, overwhelmed, deep, dark place which I'm sure you've all been in at some point or another. It, 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 what happens is, is at, when someone gets into that state, no information is going to go in. There is no rationality that you can provide that's going to shift them out of that state because no information is coming in. They go into this protection mode. And I've totally been in this protection mode. It's like you notice it when people start defending something with heat and emotion that is wildly out of proportion to what's happening, right? And they are, there's like a, an emotional edge that shows up, like a, not an edge, like a, a real, really, really strong heat. Or they completely shut down. They no longer engage. Like they can't talk. So here's what's really great. 
sounds like a deep, dark place. It sounds like a permanent, but it's not. Because emotions are like weather patterns. They blow in and they blow out. You cannot stay in one heated emotional state forever. So if somebody's angry, just wait for it to pass, right? It will pass. Just like joy will pass also, unfortunately. Um, but emotions are like weather patterns. So when someone is in a state of realm or you are in a state of realm, the only thing you can do is to take a break. That's it. End of conversation. Knowing that the conversation isn't going to end forever, you just need to take a break. A couple hours, a couple days. People will be able to, you have to allow time for people to process heated emotions like that. So that's what's really cool. When somebody shuts down, just take a break. Nobody's going to die. Just take a break, right? So this is, let's talk about working the edge. And this is where the real skill is. Okay, this is where we actually get into skills. There's going to be tools. There's going to be checklists. There's going to be planning stuff for all of us that love that. Um, so you crush ambiguity, just crush it. Okay. So, <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so three steps for change. There are many, many more. There are so many change theories. You can get into it. I love John Cotter's leading change eight-step framework if you really want to go for something really deep. But here's three things to get you started. So the first step is to get clear on the forces acting for and against the change. And we're going to look at the tool for that. The second is there's some ground conditions you want to make sure are in place. And without these ground conditions, you're pretty much doomed. <laughs> you also want to plan for the 1 to 19% of people who will, be, who will be unhappy with your change. You cannot get 100% of people on board unless you have 150 years absolute consensus building like the Quakers do for their faith and practice and da-da-da-da-da. Right? So there's going to be some amount of people who are unhappy. And you've got to think about what you want to do with that. So has anybody in here used force field analysis? No? OK, great, awesome. All right, so this is a tool developed by Kurt Lewin in the 40s. Um, I think I saw a little hand over there. Kurt Lewin in the 40s, um, he's a social psychologist. He's done a ton of amazing work with, he did, dead. Uh, <laughs> did a ton of work with, uh, with Boy Scouts, like really understanding team dynamics. That's really fascinating. But the, the notion is, just as we've been talking, that when there's a change in the works, there's forces for it and there's forces against it. You can think of these as arguments for and against as well, right? So in this tool, you're basically going like, to get clear on what those forces are. So essentially, you put your, the change you're proposing in the middle. Build a usability lab. That's your change. That's what that, this is a proposal you have, OK? I just picked this one. <laughs> we won't debate whether or not you should have a usability lab. OK, so what you do is you, on the left side, you articulate what you think the forces for that change are, your arguments for that change, right? Better understanding users, save dollars doing, I made these up, save do dollars doing your own testing, stakeholders attend sessions, teams get experience, more viable products. Now, there's a tendency, I was gonna say, don't get all information architecture on this, right? You do not, this is not comprehensive. This is a thinking tool, okay? You do not have to have a list of 80 things. Stick with the top five that you think of, because those, the top five that come to mind are probably the top five that are the most concerning to your stakeholders as well. There's good, more detail emerges as you do this, by the way. So then you want to articulate what the forces against it are. And if you don't know, you may discover you don't know what the forces against it are, in which case you have research to do. So some of the forces might be requires capital investment, no one's going to use it, user testing isn't important, uh, outsourcing is cheaper, it'll cost money to keep it up, whatever, I made these up. But you can understand there's like forces against it. So you get these five. Then what you're going to do is you're going to rank them. Well, actually, I'm sorry, not rank them. You're going to assign them a number value, scale of one to five. One being the least compelling, five being the most compelling. Compelling to your stakeholders, not compelling to you. So better understanding users. You, that may be a five for you, but for your stakeholders, two. Right? Um, the team gets experience. That's another one. We'll get better at what we do. You guys care about that. Your stakeholders are like, I just want to ship a great product. Right? They want the value. So, so you assign viable products, right? more viable products. That's something that might resonate with your stakeholders. You do the same thing on the other side. What's the, what's the level of force acting against in the other direction? Okay? So then you total with math. You total it up. You total up your values on the left side and your values on the right side, and you get a number value. 
So 16 and 16, there's no clear argument for this force to happen, right? It's a, a stalemate. I'm sure there's a physics term for it, but I can't think of what it is right now. Um, so this is where you get creative. This is where it becomes a brainstorming tool. You're, the question you're gonna ask yourself next is what do we need to affect? What, how can we raise the numbers on the left and lower the numbers on the right? What do we need to do from an action standpoint? So this is where it's a brainstorming tool, but it's also action planning. So you might say, well, there's something we need to do. If people don't think that understanding users is important, what do we need to do to show that? Is there something we can demonstrate? So there may be some kind of a specific action that you can take to raise that number. Same, you can also do the same thing on the other side. So maybe user testing isn't important, better understanding users, um, team gets experience. There may be some, maybe you have to do an education session. I don't know, right? So this is the brainstorming part because what, ah, going backwards, the other button. Dun, 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 dun. Do you love builds? Okay, one more. Pop, pop. So now you've got a clearer, a clearer case for a change and a less strong case against it, right? So this is gonna help you start to form a, form a, a much uh, a clear argument that it's in your stakeholders' interests. So don't worry about, I mean, you can actually download, I'll give a URL at the end. I've actually made a little toolkit for it because I love this tool. Um, so let's just bop through the, 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 the rest of them because they actually won't go to, they're, gonna, they're quite common sense and some levels. So the ground conditions for change, this comes out of Margaret Wheatley's work, who she does a, she does a lot of work on huge system change. Um, but that, so she's found these ground conditions and I've actually done these with my clients and they're ap it's absolutely right on. The first thing is new information has to enter the system. Whatever you know, the people who are going to be affected by your change need to know too. Right, so um, wh what's gonna happen? Where's it gonna happen? When's it gonna happen? Why are you doing it? All of that, so we're good at that, presentations, right? We, big arguments for why a change should happen. The trick is, is that it's not just that, it's, it's more of information entering the system on a regular basis. So people often don't share information because they're concerned it causes anxiety. S anxiety, so what? What's worse is distrust. If you don't share information, what you do do is build distrust and distrust kills teams. So think about how you can share information on a regular basis and be transparent. The second part is that, or the, the second condition, is that there needs to be a shared sense of purpose about the change. So you want to tie it to the mission of the organization. You want to tie it to other initiatives. There's got to be some reason that you want to do this. But more importantly, they need to be able to tie it to their own personal purpose. What's in it for me? Now, you can be cynical and say, well, what's in it for me? But people actually need, I mean, think about it on your side. If someone comes and says, we want to build a usability lab, it's like, why should I throw myself behind this? I have 800 other things to do. Why this? You need to work to help them, to help them see the value of them sharing their time with you, putting their support behind you, right? So, so working with that. So giving, uh, the, the second part of that is giving people time to process. So this is not, this is not a meeting. This is a series of meetings. It's a process. So everyone needs to understand when or if they will have input. You need to be explicit about this because input creates buy-in. Broadcasting does not create buy-in. Input creates buy-in. So because people feel respected and that they understand that they're understood and heard. You guys know this because when, when you're not asked for input and something happens to you, it sucks. Um, so you want to give people a chance to um, have, understand when they're gonna have input. And then everyone needs to understand what happens to that input. So next steps, what decisions are being made. Even if you don't know what that is, be clear. Continue to communicate, all right? We're taking in what you've said. We're not sure what we're gonna do with it exactly, but um, we're gonna consider it and you will hear back from us about our, our thought, thought process, okay? So summary of the steps, the three again. Um, this is the last part, and I love this. One to 20% of people will not be happy with your change. But what's interesting is for you to ask why and what this is about. There's a variety of reasons, and you don't always know. Someone may disagree because there's something that you need to modify, and that will get them on board. Some pe people may not agree because there's a big cultural shift happening, and they are never gonna go that way. 
So they may drift off and do something else. They may also have another idea for later down the line that you need to keep track of. So it's listening to the people who are, so it's not about dismissing the people who are not happy, but it's about listening to them and seeing what you can learn from it. So this is what I'm gonna leave you with. It's to really create space for thoughtful change. What I hope that you got from this is that it's not about a meeting or a document or a proposal. It's about a process of engaging others and paying attention to the complexity that makes us human and how that figures into our work. Um, so I just want to thank you. This is where the slides are and the tool. So it's radicallyhuman.com slash UXweekSF2013. I'm going to tweet it as well. Um, thank you. Have a good UX week. <laughs> <laughs>